Hello everyone and welcome to our room two of the staff and faculty art show for 2020. Uh, everything's in a little bit of a different format this year so uh, we're going to be doing our artist talk uh, recorded online for you all to view on your own time. In our room we are looking at meditations on life, health, and disease. And I have three artists out of the four who contributed to this room here with us today. I have Dixon Snyder, uh, John Poole, and Jennifer Brazelton. Um, so thank you to all of you guys for joining us today. So to get us started, I would like to begin with a really general question, which is just, um, you know, what you actually contributed to the show. And if you want to say a little bit about why you chose that specific piece um, to deal with our theme of life, health, and disease. Um, Jennifer, can I get you to start us off? Um, sure. Um, let's see, I have two pieces. There's one that's um, kind of uh, an organic form inside of a, a geometric uh, cage or form around it. <coughs> And then the other one is a, like a little kind of um, uh, blobby piece inside of a, a, a triangle or a, a pyramid shape. Um, and I think that I, I, I didn't actually realize that we were supposed to be in themes. I, I was thinking that we were chosen for these themes because of our work. Is that right? OK. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think of the form as kind of like either uh, um, the universe and so the the title for the first one is we're all in this together so um kind of thinking about the whole globe and then the other one is under the door under the dome <laughs> and that one's more about individual like inside your house kind of things so i chose those because that's what i'm feeling lately i hear you thank you very much uh dixon did you want to go next sure um I put it in two works, a uh, painting, abstract painting, COVID abstraction number five. When the COVID thing hit and all this isolation, I just uh, had no interest in imagery. So I made a whole bunch of abstract paintings. None of them, it's not a series at all. They're just, and I called them COVID because they sort of came out at that time. Uh, and the other is a photograph of uh, plastic flowers and done in a Vanitas style. So it's sort of a, uh, um, the Vanitas stuff is a still life about the fleeting nature of living and doing it in plastic just seemed uh, good commentary. The title's actually wrong. The title's The Age of Reasons, Not Reason. And it's sort of commentary on how we just talk too much without listening. Um, and uh, they all have different titles like that, but yeah. Thank you very much, Dixon. Uh, John, do you want to round us off here? Uh, sure. Uh, the, the piece that I put in is from a series that I started um, pretty much when the, when the whole shutdown began. Um, so that was, I believe, the third one. And I think there were seven of them. And they just, like a lot of my things, they just kind of happened. Awesome. <laughs> That's how so much of our things get produced, right? Is they just happen at the, especially, you know, when we had so much time to think about, you know, our situation in the world with this shutdown and everything like that, it gives us a little bit more time. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so my next question is, is actually just a little bit about your uh, time working in our new COVID environment. How are you guys actually approaching being an artist uh, within our our rather complex uh, time period that we're all in uh, right now. And perhaps Dix and I could start with you. Sure. Uh, how am I approaching being an artist? Um, one is that you're not, there's no audience. So you're making this stuff uh, kind of for yourself. Um, and I actually made more work during the break than I usually do. Uh, it has no destination, uh, not too worried about it's a it's a funny there's a sea change i think in this covid times that's i don't it just woke up a whole bunch of uh realizations about okay who who are we making this stuff for 
Um, and it's kind of like being on a desert island with stuff drifting up on the shore and you uh, make stuff. I mean, that's probably what artists would do anyway. But um, so yeah, they're my desert island pieces. And I um, don't, they're just stuff to make. I did about another series of photographs also. And then uh, um, just, yeah, make things to uh, entertain yourself in your world. Um, share it with people on, you know, the radio. I mean, you know, Instagram, the internet. But I don't have any, uh, yeah, has no plan um, for the, there's no ambition in the work. It's just stuff to do in an isolated time. And we're all like really accomplished artists, so we can make things. And I haven't been to the art store in months. i just using whatever's left in my studio. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered it. Yes, I think so. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I love that analogy. Of just like, you know, we are, we're, we're being, uh, we're being good global citizens right now. We aren't uh, consuming as much. We're just reusing <laughs> what we've caught uh, in our back closets. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Dixon. How about John? Did you want to go next? The, maybe the challenges of, of working as an artist uh, during this COVID time? Uh, sh sure. I, I think a lot of the studio time has been um, chipped away at by learning how to Zoom and how to teach um, online. It's it's a completely new dance, um, so that's taken away. But um, as far as making art, it's I think some people some people chew their nails, and I was kind of cursed with the bad habit of making things. Um, so I do it anyhow, you know. And, and as Dixon said, there there's no real audience. But I never. I never made things for an audience. I, I kind of made things to make the black cloud go away. Um, and yeah, if I'm not doing it, I don't feel right. So, awesome. so I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jennifer, same question to you. Um, yeah, that I agree with the John about the time um, and all of the Zoom stuff. Um, my studio isn't in my house, so I, uh, on the really intense lockdown time, I didn't really um, work on anything. I felt like, I feel like when I'm not working, I'm just thinking about it. So I'm okay with that uh, for a certain amount of time before I get antsy again. But um, so I feel like a lot of that was going on um, research, that sort of thing. Um, there's always tons of ideas, but it's just a matter of like actually getting in there. So um, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was super productive in a physical sense, but I think there's lots of, lots of stuff and I'm finally getting back in there now. So we'll see what comes out. Yeah, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that you're back to it, Jennifer. That's Thank you. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so <it's>, yeah, <laughs> this set, this time has brought lots of challenges and I hear you about the Zoom as well. Um, for sure. Um, that's well, that's great. And, and, you know, Dixon, I really liked your analogy of the island. Um, you know, we are kind of, you know, we're all in our individual, you know, Zoom boxes here, and we're all sort of working independently and all that sort of thing. And, you know, there's so much of that that goes on regularly, but now it's just been, you know, more and more and how we interact with our students as well has been shifted into that into that sort of island environment in some ways. Um, are you guys working, um, are you guys doing the in-person classes as well? Or are you just doing remote? I am. I'm, I'm, I'm doing some in-person too. Mm -hmm. I'm completely remote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been interesting this, this you know, because it's uh, one of the hard things is, you know, being able to have access to you know, a kiln, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the actual physical materials that you need to actually do these processes. So it certainly brought some, some new challenges. Um, the next question I just wanted to ask you guys was, you know, why you decided to submit these specific works for the staff and faculty uh, exhibition this year? Um, if you have, yeah. did you have specific reasons behind them or do they, um, do they show your work for, for the last year? Are they chosen for specific themes that you wanted to convey uh, to the staff and, and to the students? John, can I have you go first? If that's okay. Uh, 
kind of a difficult question. Um, I I used to when when I used to make art or make make work, I would um, I would have everything plotted out and then go in and do it kind of surgically that it'd be all drawn out and then I'd just go in and build it. And um, I learned along the way that I wouldn't, it wouldn't teach me anything by, by working that way. So I come in with a loose idea or with a, or with an idea and then I start to work and it, that in the best of times, I don't really have anything to do with what I do. Um, the call it what you will, the muse or whatever comes in and, and, you know, it, in the best of times, you're a conduit and, and, and you look down and you go, Whoa, wish I'd have thought of that. Thanks. You know, <laughs> um, and that's kind of what my work is, 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 is like now. So I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if I'm sounding like, um, naive or like an idiot, but um, that's mystic. <laughs> no, I, I think that's great. <laughs> that's great, and I think it really speaks to the piece that you contributed to this show as well with the confessional. It's uh, that, that you know, it all kind of comes together in some respects. There. Yeah, it began. Um, it it all began with um, picking up a piece of scrap metal and looking at it and going, oh. That reminds me of, and then it grew from there, pretty much on its own. And it's the other ones in the series, I think, are better, but they're not done yet. So, <laughs> can I ask you a little bit about the series before we move on to Jennifer and Dixon? Is it going to be the same sort of theme, or what's what's your idea for the series behind it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, they're all they're all different confessionals um, with different little characters and different things going on. So That's I was always told not to, not to give away too much. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no, that's great. I look forward to seeing them when they're, when they're all complete. Cause I love this one. I think it's, I think it's really great. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. Uh, Jennifer, same question to you just about, you know, um, sort of, I guess it almost is, this is almost a motivations question in, in some respects. Um, why you chose this specific piece and, and whether there was sort of something really that you wanted to show about it. Um, I didn't have like a, I don't know. I mean, kind of the, the, the themes in my work are about um, well, sometimes community or our uh, interdependence on each other. And so I kind of wanted to talk about that, but I didn't really, I don't know. It's like talking about it after you chose it. And then you're like, huh, how is that, thing? you know? So um, I think that I'm, I'm working on <laughs> with this theme for a show in November. So I kind of wanted to like put some more out, out there and look at it and think about it in a different way. Like being just online versus in person Kind of has a different feeling so i was also looking at like what photographed well to be honest with you <laughs> so there's that aspect to it too but um you know just thinking about the world situation like i said before i don't know wasn't any um deep thought that went into it i don't think oh that's great and honestly they turned out to be extremely timely pieces and uh the titles really speak to it right uh the whole all in it together and under the dome i mean that's what we've been in for the last seven months now so absolutely it just turned out to be perfectly perfectly timed <laughs> at Dixon same question to you just about motivations and, and reasons for that specific those two specific pieces of, of art uh the the abstract painting uh it was kind of on top of the pile at the moment I've been I was making these abstract works just as out of emptiness as much as anything else and so I was uh you know there's like 12 of them here I guess um and they had no it was really being empty I mean just making some marks and splashing paint around and uh moving it around and then doing when you try and do it again um until I resolve the thing into something that okay good enough 
and um, the and I in, in that case you just trust your experience and that you've been making this stuff for a very long time so something will happen um, but a deliberate uh, rejection of thought in those pieces because we had nothing but time so thinking wasn't important and um, the uh, yeah, so this is an empty, an empty painting. It is kind of COVID-y in the squiggly lines and stuff. But um, and so maybe that's why I picked that one. Um, the other one was a series that I had thought out and worked on, and uh, did a bunch of those. And they were, and I picked that one because it was, it reads pretty easily on the screen, um, and uh, but in fact they're not quite presented right because they. When I print the photographs, there's, you know, the photo is like 32 by 17 or something, but the piece of paper is like 40. And so there's a big white chunk next to them, um, which you know, I figured I would put that in the, uh, you know, if that's on display, people just be confused by it. Uh, physically, it works, but uh, on, online, I don't think it works very well. But those were, yeah, you know, that was a, you know, a typical have an idea, work through it, and take some pictures, and then go from there. And photography's gotten really interesting to me lately, uh, only as a tool to photograph something I made. You know, I did another series called Tower of Babel, and it's this big pile of paper that I glued together. Um, and uh, I thought of putting that in, too, because it's probably, the title might be a little more relevant. The, the plastic flowers, though, is, Perfect. I was, I'm going to throw them into the ocean and let them go home uh, eventually, the flowers. I'm kidding. But um, yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, can I ask you guys just a little bit about the idea of an artistic series? Because all three of you guys have made series of works and even talking about this here. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could speak to uh, perhaps students or future students about how they would go about creating something that is themed, something that is, you know, related to each other. And if there's any considerations that you, or any boundaries that you put in place when you're thinking about what's going to work uh, for a series or, or not. And I don't want to just, um, I, I won't choose <laughs> just in case somebody wants to go first here or doesn't want to talk about it, but yeah. I'll go. Okay. Um, I, for me, a series is really about the limitations you put in it. Um, and I mean, for somebody gave me a Naruto book, Naruto is the Japanese comic hero. Um, and I like it because of the graphics of the thing. And, um, and I started taking that and fashion magazine, uh, clips, but I would, I would scan the clip. So it's a piece of paper. Well, it's a piece of paper this big, and I'd scan it at 600 DPI so you get the half tones. And, and the only tools I used were scissors, glue, and, uh, and 15 different kinds of hole punches. And the, that obviously it's another abstract work because I obliterated the data but kept, or the information and kept the uh, graphicness of the work in there. And I think those limitations are really good because students think too much and uh you know and it's about digging straight down rather than digging a whole bunch of holes all over the place for me um and and that's what a series allows you to do great thank you very much dixon does anybody else have any ideas about you know about working on series as a as a concept or as a yeah Um, go ahead. I muted myself. Um, yeah. I, I think working in a series for me, um, yes, it's limiting, you know, as Dixon said, but um, for me, it's, it's exhausting an idea um, and actually um, kind of hammering it into the ground just to see how much I can get out of it. Um, and, and typically when, when I work on a series is I, I'll work on them and work for a long time and, and then they're done. And then the next two or three things that I turn around and do, 
are a lot better. They happen a lot quicker. Um, and it's like I work, I work, I work, I work, I work, I work. Okay, that series is done. And then bam, 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 bam. And I'm like, wow, these are a lot better than the ones I spent all that time on. But I kind of had to exhaust the idea, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great, John. Yeah, for sure. I love that idea of just, you know, working something from the beginning to the end and, and, and just getting it all out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Jennifer, did you want to say anything? Or um, Yeah, I think I was, yeah, thinking about series for me, it's, um, I really enjoy the physical making part. So I try to limit myself like, okay, I'm going to make three and see what this idea is doing. Um, I totally agree with the limitations like Dick Dixon was saying. It's like, you can't include everything in the kitchen sink. It's just not possible, right? So you need limitations. Um, and so I usually work in threes, look at it, and then see what's going to go on next. And a lot of times I've been working on an idea for years, but I forget that I've been working. So I like have it all on my phone and I go back and I'm like, oh my God, I was doing this in like 2000. Are you kidding me? because I don't remember, but it's all, you know, it's part of the process. So for me, it's, it's almost always series. So, um, but it evolves, which is always the interesting part. And I know I don't always, well, generally don't know where it's going. That's like the muse, right? That's the creativity part. Yep, awesome. Thank you very much, all three of you for answering that. Um, I was going to ask now a little bit about the specific works of art that you contributed to the show, if, if that's okay. Um, and I just, I wanted to start off actually with John, if you're okay with that. Uh, sorry to put sure. you on the <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I was really interested. I love this work. I think it's fabulous. Um, and I just, Thank you. yeah, it's great. It's, it's really, it's, I love, because I'm a medievalist um, at heart. And I do medieval history and stuff like that. I, you know, um, the idea of the, the metal and uh, it's creating a stained glass window look awesome. <laughs> just, just fabulous. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind talking just a little bit about, you know, the, there's a lot of different pieces to this confessional, um, you know, from the three layered base, which I'm assuming has a little bit of symbolism uh, to it, to the, you know, the figure, uh, the Virgin Mary at the top. Um, and, and, you know, even just the colors of that almost stained glass window, like type thing that you included in the box as the window. And so I was wondering if you could speak to the piece just in a little bit more detail, if that's okay. Um, how so? I mean, <laughs> um, I, I, well, when, when it began, like I said, I, I, I found a piece of scrap metal of the perf the perf steel that was on the floor. And actually there was a couple of them and I started just playing with it. And it came out in that, that pattern, you know, that little pattern. So I painted it and then just because it reminded me of a confessional window, right? Even though I've never actually been in a confession booth um, is what I thought that it would look like had I ever been there, if that makes sense. Um, and then it just grew from there, you know, the, the uh, imagery that, you know, the Virgin Mary kind of tied into all of that, the, um, yeah. And then the confession itself that's glued in the back, which is, um, which was a confession. Um, but then I, I kind of cut it up because that's supposed to remain private. Right. It's not supposed to leave the confessional, but um, and then the other imagery was just pulled from, you know, like you say, from art history <clears throat> trips to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> right, hey, <laughs> yeah, it's always one of my favorite things is teaching the, I mean, you know, the the sort of Gothic uh, cathedrals and all that sort of thing. We can usually I can get the students motivated to to see it as beautiful as as I think it is so no that's that's great thank you yeah, uh, thanks. yeah. um dixon i was going to ask you next if that's okay uh just a little bit about the vanitas and um again just being an art historian and <laughs> working with those sorts of themes um you know i thought this was a really 
kind of provocative work in the fact that you decided to use plastic figures uh, in lieu of, of, of real flowers, because of course, in, in, in the history of Veritas, it's all about, you know, the, the flowers aren't just flowers, they're this symbolic, um, they're this symbolic thing that, you know, grows and dies and, and, and the idea of memento mori, which you've also included at the base of the vase, I thought was really, you know, really linking back to that concept of, of, of the transitory nature of life. But of course, plastic isn't transitory. It's this permanent, uh, almost material. And so I thought that the ideas and the, and the comment and the, and the choice to use a vanitas uh, structure was really interesting. And, and I thought if you wouldn't mind just speaking a little bit more uh, to perhaps why you chose the Vanitas um, format, I guess, and then what your ideas behind the inclusion of these plastic items uh, was. Um, sure. Uh, well, I'm a painter, you know, and so I love the paintings. Um, and the, it was one of those being moments for okay, idea. Uh, and I realized, you know, I can't paint plastic flowers because you wouldn't know the difference, right? <laughs> um, and so the idea of, uh, oh, this has to be a photo series. Um, and, and part of it is just to make, trying to make your head spin around your perception and identity and everything else in relation to the style that most people actually might even know these things one way or another because they're pretty popular. Um, and to reconsider your position in your own transitory nature in relation to the permanent flowers, obviously. And actually everything in the thing, the background is plastic, the, uh, the tablecloth is plastic, the little dinosaurs and little bugs are plastic. And um, the, you know, that's an easy, commentary to say plastic bad, uh, which it is, but then to try and make people, to disrupt people's judgment of plastic by making something so beautiful that they can't hide. I don't know what that means exactly, but the, the idea of just disrupting, uh, disrupting expectations and perceptions and stuff is something that I'm interested in uh, as an artist. And so the advantage house is perfect for a consider your mortality in the face of the plastic flowers thing and to make it as gorgeous as possible, you know, and I got everything down the street at the 99 cent store with the, including a plastic skull and, you know, everything else I could find in there. Um, but yeah, so it was a, it's just about that collision of two different things, the gorgeousness, the plasticness, they don't, they cannot ever add up into a good thing into a thing without conflict. And I guess so, yeah, there's a lot of social stuff lurking in that in a real pretty subtle way. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for speaking to that. And I didn't know that the background and everything else and the tablecloth and was plastic as well. I think that's great. <laughs> I just add yet another sort of layer uh, to it and, and the whole constructiveness of it uh, is really interesting. I just one more question for you about this key sticks and if that's okay. Um, just about the sort of uh, the, the, the choice of like were you looking at specific referencing specific works of art here because I get a kind of almost like almost Rembrandt-esque uh, type feeling from it just because of that real contrast between the darkness of the background and then how for example, the white flower is just really highly emphasized. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm 1650 in my time frame when thinking about these things all the way, you know, and so I, that's, and that was fun to shoot because the, the, the light source is a single LED that I got at Ikea and, um, and just playing with different exposures, but it's all about the dark and the kind of gloominess of that dark and a very tiny bit of light in the place, which uh, is just really, uh, yeah, def it's it's about the antique Vanitas paintings and, 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 and reverence for them, actually, I suppose, living and um, trying to recreate that, I don't know, space. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
all right, Jennifer, now it's one for you. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. all right. Um, so, you know, I'm, I think the, I really like the fact that you're using mixed media here. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the process, because of course you're a ceramicist. And so does the ceramic come first and then the metal containers come later? Or do you conceive of them? You know, what's your sort of process in creating works like this, where you actually need quite a lot of different skill sets uh, to draw on both from the ceramics background, but then also um, the other materials that you add in to the work as well? Um, the elements that are inside of those uh, uh, pieces um, came first. And then um, I, I just, I'm always at creative reuse and scrap, always just looking, looking, looking at all these recycled things. And so I always think of it as like serendipity, you find something. Um, and in some places I find something often, which is kind of dangerous because then I just pile it up. Um, but that for me, for those, that was the process. So I, I, I made this and then I, then I combined them. So um, sometimes I just see it and, you know, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That I could work with something else I'm doing over there. So it's, um, I think the ceramic in this case definitely comes, is made first and then the, the other materials come after. And do you, when you do this, do you, do you, is there one aspect of the work that you feel is more important when you do these mixed media things, or is it the combination of the whole that's in the end, the message, or how do you, do you prioritize at all with the, with the materials? Um, I think it's the end product or the end object or whatever it is that's, that's equally important. Um, hopefully, <laughs> you know, if you're doing it right, hopefully you shouldn't be like, oh, there's the ceramic and there's the metal, right? You want them to be like a piece, you know, so. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> all right. One thing that you guys all talked about that I thought would be an interesting idea just to maybe explore a little bit more is that idea of bound objects um, and, you know, using what is around and what you, um, you know, your kind of inspiration is in, in, in some ways. Like, uh, how often do you guys find that, you know, what you have around you, just picking up things in your workshop are the basis for uh, new creative works of art? Um, okay. okay. Uh, oh, I never throw anything away. <laughs> so my studio is filled with found objects out there and it's just big piles of things that, you know, every piece of paper that was a cut off from another piece of paper, I still have. And so they, um, I find a lot of inspiration in that, uh, which is, you know, so more much more tangible than flipping through internet photos, trying to think, oh, is this not, that's not the one, that's not the one, that's just what students do all the time. And, um, trying to just stumble across your own terrain and just what's there is what I will use. Um, part of it though is that terrain is very familiar to me. So even a cut off piece of paper from something else, I have, I've already handled it once. It's part of me. And so it still matters always. Um, and, you know. Next. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, Dixon. I think I think that's great too. That idea that you know these objects that are 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 found objects in some respects, but they they actually have their own set of memories already attached to them, and then that can go on and influence the creative process as well. Yeah, I think um, you know all artists we have a hoarding problem, <laughs> and you know I'm always worried about what's going to be cleared out of my my space. <laughs> When I'm, when I'm finally done. Um, does anybody else want to go ahead and, and think about that idea of, of, of found, found objects and, and using those as in the creative process at all? I think like Dixon, um, I have a lot of stuff around and um, my space is pretty messy, but every little turn of my eye, I can see something interesting. So it, I think that's part of my process. I try not to feel bad about it. <laughs> it's just like, I have a lot of stuff and I like to look at it. So um, yeah, and then uh, the process of looking at 
at old things. Like I, I was at o Urban Or the other day and it's like, I just, in all of the mass of crap and stuff in there, it's like, I saw something on the way top shelf up there. I'm like, okay, I need that. It's just so, um, I don't know, the process is interesting. Just finding things. Yeah, for sure. I hear you. I hear you there. That idea of just like looking and finding and then that serves as the next layer of motivation for where you're going. And it might not be right away, but, you know, sticks in the back of your head for maybe later. Yeah. John, did you want to say anything to finish us off on this point? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm like everybody else. Um, a bit of a hoarder. Um, I find no joy in throwing it away. You know? <laughs> I know you're supposed to, but um, yeah, the, um, I used to go to flea markets all the time um, and walk around and there was always at least one thing that would do that to me and I'd, I'd pick it up and take it back, you know, take it back to the studio and, and not, in, not incorporate the whole thing into my work, but, but aspects of it. I think that's what I do is I dissect them um, and then I make them the way I think they should have been made in the first place, if that, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, yeah, but found objects are a great source of, uh, they're, they're stories, you know, they're, they're novels in and of themselves. Um, and yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think, you know, that, that point of this idea that they have their own background, they have their own story, and then transforming that into, you know, something that you are, you know, you can harness your creative energy to produce is so powerful. And I actually love to tie that idea back to Dixon's idea about, you know, uh, quite often, especially if, you know, we're just starting off as artists, we might be flipping to the internet for our sources, but in fact, visual world around us is really rich in motivate, like in, uh, items that can motivate us to create as well and it doesn't have to be you know um, a picture on the internet that can that can I mean which can help as well but it can be things within our space that may actually have more meaning than uh, the random picture that we come across. Um, it's also important that I think all of us have been gathering things forever just the idea that maybe I'll need this someday and then uh, I have a big box of they're little caster wheels that used to be on Victorian furniture. They're wooden. And it, they, it was at a place they were throwing them away because they don't put those on the chairs anymore. And I just grabbed them all. And I've been, you know, I used a bunch for one project and uh, that kind of thing. And they're still waiting for me next time I have an inspiration. Um, and within reach, you know, I can grab a, well, there's a microphone, you know, there's a, paper thing. I mean, it's just whatever the stuff's around me is just everywhere. And um, the, uh, and you keep it until it, you do, I do throw stuff away when it occasionally, because you get buried. And when I, I guess the artist joke is whoever has the best yard sale when you die is the most, most interesting artist. Um, it's going to be, you know, wild. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's always my uh, my my worry as well. <laughs> what's what's going to be in the pile? You know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we are almost just we just have a few minutes left actually. So thank you all so much for uh, for for participating in this. Um, but do you have any sort of final words that you wanted to say about the works of art that you contributed? We can talk more a little bit about the theme as well. That idea of um, you know this this idea of of, of COVID and the process that we have to, you know, adapt now that we're in this sort of new reality or, or any last sort of words that you want to uh, say about the works of art that you contributed uh, to the show at all. We have about, about 10 minutes or so uh, left in our conversation. Sorry, that was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> um, let me let me be more specific here. So uh, perhaps um, we can just maybe maybe what we can do actually is just draw it back a little bit to thinking about um, our students and how they are going to be creating works of art in our in our in our interesting uh, times 
and how, um, you know, they can, you know, still be incredibly creative and produce works of art like you guys have um, during both lockdown and then before. Um, and whether you have any, you know, any sort of tips perhaps based on these works of art that you might want to um, throw them or, or something, you know, words of motivation, I guess. Uh, okay. Well, I guess, and I know it in my colleagues here that, you know, you always have to be listening and, uh, which is different than finding because you don't know what you're going to want until later. And, and the students are young, so they don't have, you know, life experience is zero and all that kind of stuff. And so, and they probably live in a place you know, it's, it's not their place, it's somebody else's. And so the idea of just trying to, I don't know what that means about listening, but trying to listen better to the world and the inspirations that might come from it. Uh, and then to, and then to edit, because you have to throw out the cliches, you have to just dump them. And unless you can turn them into something that is uh, post cliche, you know, and um, that's, that's pretty vague, but it's also really true. Uh, stuff, stuff you have to discard because it's, uh, and I'm saying that as the guy who made the pretty flower painting or pretty flower photos, right? But um, trying to bring something into that that's beyond the, just the cliche of it. So listen. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, Dixon, that idea of, you know, um, you do, you have to be able to listen to actually produce art and to, uh, you know, figure out, you really have to respond to the world around you in so many respects. It's, it's the motivation for so much of our art that we produce. It's this sort of, um, it's just, this, you know, looking, looking around and making sure that you understand what you're looking at and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, any other words of wisdom, John or Jennifer? Um, I would say, um, you know, to maybe expand on what Dixon was saying about the listening and whatnot and, and not to produce cliches. I, I tell my students all the time because they're, they, you know, they hit a, a block and they're like, I, I've got no ideas. And it's like, you've got ideas, but if I have them write down five ideas really quickly, um, five really good ideas, but not to, think about them too much, but what they would do, and then tell them, now take that list and throw it away. Because if you give that same question to a dozen people, you're gonna find in that first five, probably all of them are gonna have at least three, maybe four, and they're gonna be trite and cliche, you know what I mean? Um, and then do another list of 10 after that, and somewhere in that list is gonna be the one that's that's yours and is unique and also speaks to the problem. Um, as far as listening, um, I, I couldn't agree with him more about that. Um, and I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, it was Emmy Lou Harris actually that said, um, she was talking about the muse and she said, when the muse comes to town, you better have your bags packed because I'm not gonna wait around and you don't know where you're going or how long you're going for. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to have those bags packed. And, and when those ideas come, grab your bags and run. Maybe that's a bad analogy right now with all the fires going on. <laughs> but anyhow. Yeah, if it's not one thing, it's another, right? Right. <laughs> For sure. I think that's a great analogy. That's yeah. That's that's that's, that's 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 those are some great words of wisdom. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Jennifer, do you want to finish this off with this? Um, yeah, I, I I agree with both. The the listening is a really good time to be listening, and also like I feel like what John was saying is be prepared when when the call comes. Like be ready to pick up the phone. Um, so I completely agree with those. And I also, and I also think that, um, I mean, they're, they're in school, so be open to whatever 
whatever medium you're working in, whatever material it is, and, and just listen through whatever that is. So uh, I think being open to that, um, but just keep at it. That's my, that's my advice. Thank you very much. And yeah, I mean, it's a, this is definitely a challenging time to be a student for sure. Um, you know, it's especially so if you're a creative person who might not have access to all the usual materials that you might within, um, within the, within the art department and everything like that. So um, that idea of keeping at it and keeping motivated and, you know, that's such a important thing to do. And, and it's, it is, we've sort of got our own, we were put in to our own sort of limitations because of our situation, but that can actually serve as a real powerful uh, motivation as well in some, in some respects. Uh, create our own series, I guess, COVID, uh, <laughs> COVID limitations on, on artistic processes. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap up our chat, uh, or at least the recording here. So just as a, as a quick note for, for the recording, thank you to everybody for watching. And uh, uh, thank you uh, for all of our three artists, our, for our faculty and staff show for 2020. Uh, this particular video is posted online um, on our gallery page. And uh, please ensure to check out the other at two talks that will be coming up. Uh, one was posted on September 24th and the other one will be coming up on October 8th. Uh, so ensure to check, check those out and check out all the works of art uh, from our incredibly uh, talented faculty and staff uh, for our 2020 show.